This is Yesterzine, the monthly magazine show about monthly magazines. We take a magazine from the golden age, play the games they liked most and least, and flip through to find out what gaming was like when a games company unironically called a product the Ultra. We're thinking of Nintendo of course, but astonishingly we're not thinking of the Ultra 64. If only because they wisely saw the better of that before they asked anyone to actually buy it. That decision, of course, helped by the fact that, despite us joining Total with issue 36 at the end of 1994, the 64 wouldn't reach the UK until well into 1997. I do wonder if magazines devoting huge space to 64 releases, as Total do here with Killer Instinct and Cruise in USA so far ahead of release, affected the SNES, which itself was not three years old in the UK. Our gaming heaven was originally sneakily teased as a next generation game in some circles, and does make use of Nintendo's deal with Silicon Graphics for the 64 to also use that technology for itself. Our gaming hell will make you think we're back in the 80s, because it's a TV series licensed platform beat-em-up, total credits to Ocean. But had the market moved on rather by what would be the last Christmas in the UK without a Sony PlayStation? And so first to our gaming heaven, which is a rare game indeed. So here we are then once again, at the nexus of gaming. If you ask almost anyone what the single biggest event that changed gaming was, then all but two groups will choose something that happened somewhere in these two or three years in the mid-90s. The two groups you ask? Well, the sim racers might choose the advent of proper in-home virtual reality, and anyone who is into hardcore racing will see the argument there at least. And of course, some of the less perceptive Americans will go to their usual tedious The NES Save gaming rants. And you all know how much we all enjoy those as we sit there not noticing the video games crash at all because we were all quite happily playing Manic Miner. But everyone else is probably going to land somewhere around here. They might cite the launch of the Sony PlayStation, and they would have a point of course. It certainly brought gaming to an entire new generation, and probably decided once and for all that it would be an industry alongside movies and music rather than something that drifted away from the mainstream. We discussed last month how there's a case to be made that the PlayStation booked the PC's place as the one credible survivor of the gaming computers. We told the story a couple of years back of how Microsoft only made a console because they were scared of the rumoured media capability of the PlayStation 2. And of course they only had the capability to build the direct Xbox because of the work made on Windows games partially prompted by the format being outshone by the PlayStation in the first place. Other than Nintendo, who have essentially stopped competing in the same market, no one from the pre-PlayStation launch is producing mainstream gaming hardware now. The PlayStation though was basically the distillation of everyone else's advances. This channel has always advocated that the one true game changer if you will was the invention of the CD-ROM and the way it changed the fundamental approach of gaming design from account for every byte to use all the space you want mate. This for me is more of a change in everyone's approach than 2D to 3D. Not least because there was 2D after and 3D before, and both benefit from unconstrained storage. But textured 3D graphics basically became a thing about now. Universal analog controls become a thing about now. The racers will point at force feedback emerging around now. Games can have real soundtracks from around now. Proper, gigantic open worlds became a thing about now. Pixel perfect arcade conversions start to become possible. The middle half of the 90s changed everything. And it was the power of the new machines like the PlayStation, and yes, the Saturn, 3DO, Jaguar and N64 as well, that made these things possible. Then Nintendo invited everyone to see the new game from one of their third parties. A third party they'd had enough confidence in to buy a quarter of. A developer who had owned the NES for a lot of people. But on SNES had merely released a couple of sequels to this Battletoads game. And then two things happened. In an effort to gear up for Project Reality, Rare had invested heavily in Silicon Graphics workstations. Nintendo had allowed them free reign to choose any license they wanted from their catalogue. And then the N64's release started to slide backwards. Nintendo needed a headline. Rare needed something to do. And in 1994, the result was this.
For a SNES game, the intro is rather a statement, isn't it? And it continues into the game. Donkey Kong Country looks like nothing else, on any format really. It probably helps that there hadn't been a mainstream game with Donkey Kong as the main character since the first one 13 years earlier, and that the last console appearance of the franchise had been Donkey Kong Jr. Math, which was still over 10 years old and exactly as much fun as it sounds and looks. Donkey Kong Country is also the first time most people got to play as Donkey Kong, unless they owned a couple of the more obscure games of Watch from 1984. Or so they thought, because perhaps in an effort to distance the character from his roots as an antagonist, this isn't Donkey Kong. It's his grandson. That's the character originally known as Donkey Kong, but now christened Cranky Kong. It's basically like what they did to the Leisure Suit Larry series, but with a diametrically opposed effect on the quality of the resulting games. Just watching this through you can see the stir it caused. I've heard various rumours as to the extent, if any, that people at CES 1994 believed they were seeing an N64 game, right up to the presence of a Silicon Graphics workstation on the desk and the SNES hiding below. But in a world where you hadn't yet seen Project Reality in person, this could fool you into thinking it was a generational leap. Even now, Donkey Kong Country somehow dodges the curse of pre-rendered graphics in games where they tend to age like anti-vaxxers. Whereas something like... Well, let's use this clip again. Whereas something like Rise of the Robots looks pretty awful about as soon as it was released, even now Donkey Kong Country looks damn good. Maybe it's helped by the fact it's not exactly Sonic quick, but then neither was Mario. And it's worth remembering that Sonic's one attempt to use these kind of graphics in this era was not a triumph. Somehow they've avoided the traditional issues like the characters not looking like they're connected to the level. And the credit there presumably has to go entirely to the background art design, which uses a much more mature palette than both the big platform hitters, and it pays off in spades. It's possibly also the starting point of muted colours becoming grey-green-brown for an entire decade of gaming history, but I don't think we can go blaming Donkey Kong Country for that one entirely, especially when it could be argued Rare were about to commit a much worse crime in that area. In other areas, DKC is more traditional. At its heart, it's a left to right 2D platformer where you collect a hundred of a thing to get an extra life, collect a few other hidden things for an extra life, collect one of a very special thing to get an extra life, touch a thing to get a restart point, jump on enemies' heads to make them not enemies, and swear at the controls for not responding, causing you to walk clean off the ledge despite the fact you pressed the goddamn button, you bastard. Already on the second level, it's proving it's not a one-trick pony, with some really lovely driving rain and lighting effects for the time, all of which somehow being pushed along without the aid of any of the available expansion chits for the SNES. This is pure undiluted superpower doing the work. Who needs blast processing? The music too is some of the SNES's best. Jolly when it needs to be, down-tempo when the game is trying to evoke a mood, and almost like a film soundtrack at times. The music on the map screen is possibly second only to cannon fodder in the list of great hub world backgrounds. CDs would make chiptunes themselves somewhat obsolete in the years to come, sure but the style being grasped for in this game would endure through that transition. The other area DKC moves from the very traditional is the two active player characters. Unlike Tails' passive assistance in Sonic 2, here you are both Donkey Kong and his nephew Diddy at once. If the one you're actively controlling takes a hit, then you switch to controlling the other. It does mean the game has to be careful though. While the abilities of these two are not 100% identical, Red did have to ensure you could at least finish a level with either, even if you couldn't get all the bonuses. Because if you weren't in sight of one of the Donkey Kong barrels, then you could get yourself trapped otherwise. In other removals from the norm, Donkey Kong Country contains possibly the one time in gaming where the water level wasn't an active annoyance. The characters can't drown, but they can co-op a fish to fight for them, and exploring this level is a real delight, with the controls working perfectly to feel like you're moving through something, 
without being quite as horribly sluggish as they are for, say, Sonic. The music in this level is again absolutely top notch. You could argue Total might be over egging it with a 97, although in their defence Mario All Stars have picked up 99 and Mario's World and 3 both 98. The score you're going to find out in a few minutes that they gave the gaming hell will also indicate that they are not a Baseline is 65 magazine. Donkey Kong Country is not perfect by any means. Sometimes it's a little too easy to blunder off the edge of a platform, partially because of a slight lack of responsiveness, maybe due to a level of lag that I don't think I can quite pin on the SNES Mini I happen to be using to get this footage. It's a good thing I'm using a SNES Mini too, because having congratulated it for being bullshit free in its water level, the Minecraft level throws it straight back and I make very, very liberal use of the save state function on the Mini. That said, this occurs pretty soon after one of the game's semi-frequent actual save points as well. You'll need it. The Minecraft level is full of the annoying platform game not quite being a platform game tropes. Parts of it are essentially blind, other parts you get surprised by the end of a platform or more annoyingly the crashed minecarts. While hitting something only costs you one of the two characters, the slowdown can make it impossible to make the next jump as well. I got through it in time, just as I have in previous lives, but really it became a bit of a memorization test and it doesn't strike me as a level you'd want to go back to in order to, ironically, mine the bonuses. If I'd been playing this on a real machine, I would certainly have got at least one game over that I wouldn't feel was entirely my fault. Even straight after that though, it's throwing out ideas others might base entire games around, with these barrels that pause and unpause otherwise unbeatable enemies. We're absolutely reaching the limit of my skills here and I lose a lot of lies through not realising where things go, but none of it is it not obeying my inputs, it's just it being a bit of a bastard, and there is at least another save point directly after. And this seems like a good place to stop spoiling things for you. Without the rewinds, we're already about 40 minutes into the game here, but it's taken me a lot longer. Despite being a game released pretty close to that universe changing launch of the PlayStation in Japan, Donkey Kong Country was the third best-selling game of the machine's life, behind only the two games we already mentioned, and astonishingly ahead of both Mario Kart and Street Fighter 2. The SNES also held on long enough that this is merely the first in a trilogy. Diddy Kong was joined by his friend Dixie Kong, presumably no relation, in Diddy Kong's Quest, which comes up next in the all-time bestseller list for the machine, sixth, ahead of Link to the Past despite being released four years after it. And the concluding part of the trilogy, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, was number 11. That's a game released two years after the PlayStation, which nonetheless outsold F-Zero, Chrono Trigger, SimCity, Pilot Wings, and every single Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest game the SNES ever saw a version of. It starred Dixie Kong from the second game and what is apparently her cousin, Kiddie Kong. The family tree of this series is considerably more complex than even your average royal families, Although, of course, considerably less... dense. Donkey Kong is one of those games that's been really evaluated a bit in recent times. There are people who'll tell you it's not good. There are people who'll somehow try and tell you it was never good and not just the Sonic obsessives. They were wrong then. They were wrong about then. And they are wrong about now. I don't know what prompts it, maybe people just don't think slower, more measured platformers have a place. Maybe it's an inherent bias against its graphical style. Maybe it's some conversions and newer games that were perhaps not quite up to the same standard, especially after Rare became a Microsoft studio a few years later. Whatever it is, don't let them affect you. Donkey Kong Country is a thing worth having, even when it's surprisingly expensive to buy in an original form now. With the PlayStation and the strongest, quickest era of evolution in video games well underway at this point, it proved that the Old Testament era of gaming had just a few tricks left up its sleeve. The main cover feature of Total this month is the complete guide to Nintendo. One might question immediately just what the heck they think they've been doing for the previous 35 issues up to this point, but what this really takes the form of is a collection of tips for their favourite games and the fact the magazine contains news, reviews and previews. A again making me question whether the previous 35 issues are just a single picture of a NES and a caption saying 
Does anyone know how to turn this thing on? Also, your mum's traditional first message on Tinder. There is one more feature though, an eight page article on the history of Nintendo that basically contains about a page of actual information and seven pages of a weird self-indulgent parody of Back to the Future, as Atko takes a time-travelling Lotus back in time in order to discover it for himself. It's an interesting perspective though, because if you had to point to the absolute high point of Nintendo as a worldwide gaming entity, controversially, I'm going to say it's here, at the apex of the 16-bit era, and with what appeared to be a megaton of a next generation console on the way in 1995. We'll get to that, and give you time to load the words Wii and Switch into the angry comment generator, because let's take a quick whistle-stop tour of how we got to late 1994. I'm always interested in those gaming facts that those of us who live on the internet just assume everyone knows. There's a video in this, and one of those facts that we assume everyone knows is that Nintendo was not founded to make video games. Probably for the best really, because Nintendo is also quite possibly much older than you assumed. The Game Boy feels like an early era Nintendo product for instance, but it was released in the West around the 100th anniversary of the company. Nintendo were founded by Fuwajiro Yamauchi in 1889, as Total point out, the same year the telephone was invented, and they were founded to make what would probably now be called boutique artisan playing cards. These are not what the West would call playing cards, they're a 48 card 12 suit deck known as Hanafuda, or flower cards, and they're incredibly pretty themed designs that do rather prove that sometimes stereotypes of a nation become that for a reason. The most comprehensible of the games they can play is Koi Koi, a sort of risk-reward poker of a game where you take turns trying to form certain point scoring combinations. The risk coming from these conversations being stealable for bonuses. You don't have to understand that description though, because in another stereotype being true situation, Nintendo do of course remember their heritage. The game Koi Koi can be found in two recent Nintendo releases. 2006's Clubhouse Games for the DS, and its sequel come reissue 51 Worldwide Classics for the Switch. Nintendo aren't finished with playing cards there though, because as of early 2022, they still make them. Nintendo were born a playing card company, and they remain one, even issuing special packs based on Mario, Kirby and Pokemon over the years. Those limited editions go for silly money. But if you just want to own a lovely little piece of gaming trivia, you could get yourself a modern pack of Nintendo made Hanafuda cards delivered to the UK for 20 quid. I know, I did. The real driving force in making Nintendo something the rest of us would recognise though is the founder's great grandson Hiroshi Yamauchi. While he was the great grandson, he had been raised by his grandparents and was the natural continuation choice despite the fact he hadn't yet finished his law degree when illness forced his grandfather's retirement. Hiroshi was anything other than the continuation choice in reality though. He only agreed to the job if he became the only founding family member still working for the company. And despite being young with literally no commercial experience, he assumed total control, firing long-term employees and demanding exclusive approval of new products. And new products there were because on a visit to the US to build on the success of a card licensing deal with Disney, Yamauchi-san visited the offices of the United States Playing Card Company, better known in the UK as the maker of the famous bicycle playing cards. Seeing that even the titans of Western playing card manufacturers were a small company, he realised that if he wanted to grow Nintendo, he needed to do more. If you didn't know the playing card thing before, you might still be reeling. But I don't think if I gave you a month you'd guess the main two industries he chose to diversify into. In fact, let's test this. I'm going to give you the length of the intro to Sonic 3D to think, and we'll meet back here once Sonic has punched a screen. Okay, so who had Taxi Company? 
In theory, perfectly sensible, but in reality Nintendo took a bath on the deal and only owned the company for a few months in the very early 1960s. It is, though, still operating and does airport transfers if you want to make your gaming trip to Tokyo especially authentic. And if you didn't have Taxi Company, then you absolutely did not have Rent Room by the Hour Love Hotel. It does make a mockery that 30 years later Nintendo were pretending to have a moral objection to games like Night Trap, while under exactly the same corporate leadership, doesn't it? Especially as there were rumours that Yamauchi liked to test the products, as it were. I promised you a release product called the Ultra, and it's coming now. An engineer called Gunpai Yokei, and some of your ears just immediately pricked up at that name, invented this, the Ultra Hand, to amuse himself. But Yamauchi commissioned it as a real product. Despite being a laughably simple device, they sold a million of the things in the late 60s, and it launched the transition era of Nintendo, wherein they became one of Japan's largest toy companies. If you want an easter egg, the Ultra Hand appears subtly in many Nintendo games, including here in Mario Kart. Many of the toys from this era were at least partially electrical in nature, the first of those being their first electrical toy, and quite possibly their first export to the West, the infamous Love Tester. Seriously, Night Trap was a problem, was it Nintendo? But it's about here the future path of the company was set, as the management team came up with the laser clay shooting system, essentially what you'd understand today as a light gun game, but done without any actual computer graphics. This, and its enforced miniaturised follow-up thanks to a serious recession in Japan, largely saved Nintendo, and led directly to Nintendo investigating the future of bringing these games into the home. A decision which resulted in their first console system, the Colour TV Game 6, which was the same orange as apparently was legally mandated for every one of these early machines, and thanks to a licence from Magnavox for Pong, which basically no one else bothered to get, Nintendo were able to release the 6 and its three follow-ups cheap and plentifully. If there was a winner of the first generation of home video gaming, Nintendo's 3 million colour games over the next 6 years were probably it. And then we reach the Game & Watch and the Famicom, and you know how this goes from here. Nintendo own the NTSC regions for the entire 80s in the first half of the 90s. In the US specifically, they're essentially credited with dragging the entire industry out of a slump the rest of the world didn't even notice. As we join the story in 1994, Hiroshi is still in charge and will continue to be until around the launch of the GameCube in 2002. In 1994, Nintendo were one of the most profitable companies in the entire world, and seemingly untouchable, with the N64 due in 1995, the Game Boy still dominant with its own follow-up the Virtual Boy imminent, and Sega torpedoing themselves by launching format after format. We know this didn't quite happen of course, Nintendo would never be quite this strong again. Sony came along and changed everything, and the N64 was flawed compared to the competition in several respects, most notably texture resolution and storage. It held up okay in the West, but in Japan sold barely a quarter of the SNES's numbers. The GameCube, cruelly overlooked, did worse in all regions than the 64, and the Virtual Boy's panicked late redesign to remove its best features and disastrous sales and tendency to induce migraines more effectively than a self-assessment tax form makes it now a running joke we may have to talk about more sometime. The Wii sold well, sure, but mainly early in its life, and despite being considered a phenomenon, it was actually ultimately outsold by the Xbox 360 in America and by the PlayStation 3 in Europe. The Wii U struggled to 13% of the Wii's worldwide sales, and by then Nintendo had got out of competing in the front line. The Switch is a tremendous product and a fantastic game machine, but really it is a Game Boy follow-up. It's a handheld machine with a TV dock, and no longer is Nintendo competing on technology like they did in the Donkey Kong Country days. The company, and us, might be better for that though. But this is just another focus switch. Nintendo is a fun company, not a technology one or even a games one really. Hiroshi played a video game exactly once and didn't care for it although he was a legendary player of the board game Go. 
and until he was replaced by the much-missed Satoru Iwata, Nintendo was never run by games people. It isn't now either. Current president Shintaro Furukara is an accountant by background, with a political science degree. With this information, it perhaps makes sense that seeing the titans of Sony and Microsoft taking the technology side of gaming from them, that Nintendo shrugged and went back to doing what they actually do best, making people happy. And long may it continue. In the generation before this, there was something of a trope. We've referenced it ourselves before. If there was a major property to be licensed, it'd end up as a platform come beat em up and it would be made by Ocean. I'm sure you'll remember some of them. Batman, Robocop, Total Recall, Adam's Family, Lethal Weapon, Hook, Navy Seals, Platoon, Rambo, I could go on. Knight Rider, Hudson Hawk, Cool World, Hook. The quality was variable, but there were certainly successes. Batman and its subsequent bundling with the Amiga is a large part of the making of that format, and at the time at least, Robocop 3's 3D graphics were revolutionary on the A500, and Highlander also existed. And all this would have been relevant if Total's proofreader wasn't in the toilet that day, because while they claim this was published by Ocean, when I bought myself an actual cart of the thing, because this show does research properly, I note a distinct lack of Ocean logos. Because it bloody wasn't, was it? It was published by Bandai, and now I have to change the whole bloody intro. Wankers. Look at the cart total. Look at it. Look how much the Ocean logo isn't. Is that an Ocean logo total? No it isn't, it's the Nintendo seal of quality. Funny how no bastard ever made a total seal of quality, isn't it? <sighs> the intro will cheer you right up though. That is lovely work from the audio engineer Kinyuo Yamashita, especially when you get to this bit. She's done good, and I'm sure this is carried over into the... Uh, what? Who is this guy? He looks like a reject from a Sierra adventure. And knives. Well-known thing that doesn't cause bleeding. What's this? H who stands like any of this? H how do Kimberly's arms even work? And then our free choice of character. Jason is well in time with the music here. Some great moves, and then Kimberly. Okay, I think I've seen that dance move before and it is not safe for work. But it's better than Zack who, well I think this is an unfortunate coincidence of resolution but that's bordering on racially problematic. Moving on, Trini's got a washing her hands vibe going on and Billy, now I don't know the series but is Billy the kind of slightly slow character you wouldn't use today? It's just he reminds me of one of the aliens from Men in Black. So you should know as we get settled in that Total was a magazine that refreshingly used the range of percentages available to it. Last we saw them on this show, Mario Allstars was picking up that 99% we mentioned earlier. But the gaming hell that month was George Foreman's KO Boxing, a game that would have been more fun if it was licensed from the grill rather than the sport. They gave it 8%, and on that basis the 18 Power Rangers got might almost seem generous. Although our reviewer here is Atco, the same nice gentleman who reviewed Donkey Kong, and wrote the Nintendo feature. This isn't so much a total episode as an Atco one at this point. What we've discovered is at least in this early stage, Power Rangers is only going to use two of the six buttons the SNES controller gives us. This is us beginning in what the game calls Teenage Mode, so presumably our main enemies are serious acne outbreaks and accidentally knocking half a dinner set off the table because you're a foot and a half taller than you were yesterday. Whatever it is, it's a problem, because surely the point of playing the Power Rangers game is to play as Power Rangers. When you play Death and Return of Superman, he's Superman. 
You don't spend the first five minutes of the level trying to kill Superman's enemies as Clark Kent by viciously doing a cryptic crossword in their general direction. I guess it's an attempt at variety in a genre that often struggles for such things, but rarely is make the same thing but a bit worse the variety you're aiming for. I can tell you now, every stage opens with these sections, and it has the additional problem that, bosses aside, they're the difficult bit. If you get to the point where, mercifully, your character decides it's worth getting the Lycra on, then from that point you're fighting the same enemies but with better weapons. And it's a lot more fun. It does seem that this is what the game was designed to be, and maybe they should have skipped the teenage sections. Your reach is better, you have proper weapons, each character has their own special move. What's not changed is you're still fighting iterations on the same basic enemy, with their colour denoting how much punishment they can take before dying, starting with those basic black suit dudes you've seen me dispatch in one hit. And then you're at the boss, who unsurprisingly is the dude you met in the middle of the level that caused you to enter cosplay mode in the first place. Boss 1 is relatively simple, in that I defeated him first time, with only a minor amount of cheating. This is mainly because, at least in stage 1, he's roughly the same as any other enemy, you just keep moving. Then it all goes Monty Python as you hack his arms off. It is but a flesh wound, although I have to say I don't remember the Black Knight in the Holy Grail having the ability to hover 10 feet above the ground and shoot fire, but then it's been a while since I watched it. Then he becomes just a head and does similar and I cannot hit him. If you've been paying attention though, you'll have seen me pick up a bomb earlier, so that takes care of that. I'm going to show you a bit into stage 2, mostly because that's as far as I've currently got thanks to the aforementioned teenage mode. The game though throws some nice stuff at you. While the enemies don't change much, there are tricks. For a start, these turrets that you have to avoid the fire from while taking the enemies out. The nice part about this is, the shots from the turrets can also hit said enemies, and having been through this part a few times I now entirely rely on that to get through as unscathed as possible. Weirdly the same doesn't apply to these barrels, which will hurt you but roll straight past the enemies. Still, it's another addition which rises this above… well frankly rises it above deserving 18%. I like this. I'm finding myself wanting to go back for one more go and I really wasn't expecting that. If you'd given me this blind and then claimed it was a candidate for the 73% trials, I'd have probably accepted that without question. Seven levels is probably short, and the contemporary reviews did claim it was easy, but having looked at some full playthroughs, it's about an hour if you know what you're doing, and that is not dissimilar to most of the Sonic games. The other reason I had to grab a look at a full run, in this case courtesy of the people at Nintendo Complete, is that one of Total's other gripes was it was also a platform game. I've been fooled before, when Sega Power hilariously claimed the same of Gunstar Heroes, but actually there is some mild platforming in this. I played through Act 3 as far as I could and couldn't quite reach the main part of it, but to be fair the jumping physics in this are actually good, so I don't see it being a problem. Total say pick a lane, but there's nothing wrong with a game doing two things. This is not a 97% game. It's probably not a 79% game, especially when sold at 50 actual quid. But in a world where licenses were dusted out in sometimes incredibly awful form, we've certainly seen a few of them in our time on this show, I think Power Rangers was incredibly hard done by here. I'm actually a little suspicious they never played past the first part of the first stage to be honest, perhaps so they could get back to playing Donkey Kong Country. I don't think they played even the platforming I did in Act 3, much less the whole game. The cynical would suggest they didn't even play it long enough to notice the lack of an ocean logo. Today? You should pop this in your emulator device, if only for that lovely soundtrack. I bought the cartridge, because it seems serendipity that one came into my local CEX literally the day I picked this magazine issue, but it's not a game I'm going to regret owning, and the combination of its not huge length and password system means that of the games we talked about today, it's this I might have the best chance of finishing on real hardware. Funny we should mention the 73% trials though. For those who don't know, 73 was a metric defined by Amiga Power as the minimum mark you could give a game that wouldn't annoy the publisher or the fanboys. One of the things they said to look for in a 73% review was that the content of the review was some variation on, if you like this sort of thing, you'll like this. 
On a related note, here's Brainies, a game which totaled twice compared to Bomberman somehow, before concluding with, if you like this sort of thing, you'll like this. Did the entire office just play Donkey Kong all month or something? On the back page, the jaw-defying and eye-dropping skills of Ben from One Credit Classics. A man who can rip apart ghouls and ghosts and put it back together, upside down and back to front. The man got game, is what I'm saying. Most recently, I've very much been enjoying his quest to finish Street Fighter 2 on SNES, using the hardest difficulty and with a score of at least 1 million points. A feat which seems impossible at first glance. And second glance. And glances 3 through 432, excepting 184 because I was drunk and thought I could do anything. I lost to the first character. Also, I was accidentally playing Mortal Kombat. What a Valentine's Day that was. Ben, though, is absolutely playing Street Fighter, and many other games, both in video and stream form. If you want to see if there's an exciting conclusion to the Million Point Challenge, pop over and give the man a sub, will you? And if you haven't done the same here, it would cost you nothing and make me very happy, because I'm closing on a thousand, and while I don't give a crap about round numbers, it turns out that YouTube very much gives a crap about that particular round number. Plus, Bloggo's been lording his thousand subscribers plaque over me for ages now. YouTube don't actually send you one at a thousand. He made it himself. But still, I don't have one and that annoys me. Plus, it's the point at which, pending a few more view hours, that YouTube will at least let me choose where it inserts the annoying adverts you've probably had to sit through to watch this. I make a show with a three-act structure for a reason, YouTube. So to help with those watch hours, why not come back next month, where another magazine will be pulled apart and yelled at. Go, go, Power Rangers! <laughs>